the the center for soft power uh, is a think tank which uh, looks at india's influence outside india okay and uh, there there are usually soft power ratings uh, every year for every country and um, despite having such rich cultural traditions uh, sadly india doesn't uh, feature very highly in these rankings so it's our uh, endeavor to um, project uh, our culture and tradition in a way which will uh, attract more non indians to our culture and also help to document and preserve these traditions to some extent okay. so sounds good yeah. you uh, you you start when was your first trip to india and did your uh, interest in india start before that before you came uh well i had some inter- let, let me go back so my first trip was in 1970 um uh, which is like 30 50 years ago right so um trying to think whether it was 70 or 71 but anyway i think it was 1970 and i only had a passing interest in india i'll tell you how i got there i was doing my play uh Dionysus in 69. I don't know if you know that performance at all. Uh, but it was a play based on a Greek uh, uh, tragedy, the Bacchae by Euripides. Mm. And uh, I actually it was 1971 when I first went. And a person came to the at the end of one of the performances, a man came up to me, I always used to hang around and talk to uh, the, the audience and it was an environmental theater production. In other words, it had no stage as such, uh, the audience, and it had a lot of audience participation and so on. And he said to me, it's clear from your performance that you've studied or been to Asia, and not India, but Asia. And I said, no, I really haven't. I mean, I know a little bit, but I, I haven't uh, gone to Asia. He said, you should go. And I said, okay, I was a very young man. I said, you should send me. And he said, okay, I will. And he handed me his card. And the man's name was Porter McRae. And he was head of the uh, organization called the John D. Rockefeller the Third Fund, which later became the Asian Cultural Council, uh, and which is a major funder for trips to Asia. To make a long story short, he subsidized a uh, six-month-long trip to Asia. And the first four months of that uh, six month long trip was spent in India. India was the first place I went to in Asia. But after India, I also went to Japan and Indonesia and Korea and Taiwan and Papua New Guinea and Australia uh, and uh, Singapore, uh, many, many different places, Thailand. But uh, India was the first place I went to. And when I arrived in India, the uh, I I wasn't exactly, you know, I was, let's say, disoriented. It was I was uh, 1971, so I was in my 30s, and uh, I met there. Uh, somebody introduced me to. I was in touch with the American uh, Institute AIIS of Indian Studies, and I was already a professor as well as a theater director. And I was introduced to Suresh Avasti. Do you know him, who he was? He was the head of the Sangeet Natak Academy, the secretary of the Sangeet Natak Academy. And I said to him, he said, what are you interested in? And I said, well, I'm not interested particularly in Western theater as it's practiced in India. I don't even like Western theater as it's practiced in the West. So uh, I'm not interested in things that go on the proscenium stage. I'm not interested in, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, Indians may stay Shakespeare or Chekhov or what have you. Uh, but I am interested in what is Indian performance. So he, uh, the Sangeet Natak, he was himself by, uh, by origin a, a man from one of the villages. Not He was not born in Mumbai or, uh, you know, Delhi or any of those places. He was from Uttar Pradesh, I've forgotten, near Lucknow. At any rate, he knew everyone and he gave me letters of introductions or made phone calls so that I saw many, many different forms. I traveled around India and saw many different forms of uh, performance. 
uh, from Yakshagana to Katakali to uh, Teyam uh, to Kalaria Payatu to uh, uh, obviously brought brought Natyam Odissi, uh, Ka, you know Katak, uh, Tama, different forms of Tamasha, uh, Pan Pater. I mean there were many, and uh, at the same time I decided to settle for a couple of months so the, out of the four months in uh, Chennai, which is, you know, was Madras at that point. And I lived, uh, I was, you know, uh, so much of my life has been fortunate accident. I don't know who arranged it, but uh, I was uh, given, uh, I came, went to live with a family that had a house in Shastrinagar near Kalakshetra. And at that point, it was the first time I saw Bala Saraswati dance. It was a great experience. Uh, and I watched some of the training in Bharatanatyam, but I also began to study yoga. And I studied with a man, a Krishna Machari. I don't know if you know who he is, but he was very famous and he was very good. And he took me on as his uh, private one-on-one -on -one student. He, he, he did teach foreigners, but he took a liking to me. And of course I admired him and he said that I could, after my course, it was only a, a month or so, a little more, but it was every day. And he said, I could teach it, teach yoga. So I still practice yoga and I have taught it uh, never to, uh, uh, I teach it as part of my uh, performer training. I don't teach yoga as a yoga teacher, but my notebooks that I kept from Krishnamachari's teachings, there's a, a, a magazine that they've been published and so on. So that was a very, very important part of my uh, experience. Later on, I returned to India often. It's at that, that first time, I did not spend that much time in Kerala. But the second time, which was in 1976, was the first time I saw Ram, Ram Lila, which was very important to me. And I also revisited a lot of these performances. And I brought my own production of Brecht's Mother Courage and Her Children to India. And we performed it in Delhi and Lucknow and Calcutta in a small village outside of Calcutta. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not a proscenium based performance. It's, uh, it's in my style of theater. I don't know if you know my environmental theater has seen some of the films. And uh, after that tour, which was about a month and a half, I stayed in India that time for about a year, a little less than a year. And I, I went for the summer to live in uh, Chiruturuti, uh, which is where the Katakali Kalamandalam is. Uh, the, and that's where I first really uh, read the Natya Shastra. And, uh, and I also studied Katakali. I was like <laughs> 1976, uh, 44, 54, 64, 74. I was 42 years old, but I said, I want to take the introductory training like the eight year old boys. So they thought I was a little crazy. They wanted to give me a special teacher. I said, I didn't want a special teacher. I said, I'm not a performer anyway. I'll never perform this. So it's not that I want to think I can become a Katakali performer or even have it in, influence me in, 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 at that level. But I, if I'm to understand what you're doing, I have to experience it in my own body, the way I experienced uh, yoga as a practice. So I was given the massage, which was painful and pleasurable at the same time. And I did the training and sometimes they laughed at me. We had a good time because I'm doing this with eight or nine or 10 year old boys who could really do it. And I, but I also uh, got to learn it at a certain deep level. And in, in relationship to that, I was living in this uh, bungalow uh, and I was reading the Natya Shastra. So uh, I, I don't believe you know, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I don't believe in it, in that there's an unbroken tradition uh, from uh, you know uh, the uh, Bharata to now. I, I know, I know, I'm a scholar after all, and I know some of the history of the text. It was uh, lost or disparaged, and then found by the Orientalists, and then reappropriated. And you know, I never bought into it. In fact, I've written quite a bit about that Bharatanatyam is the classical dance on broken no. It's a reform, it's connected to Sadarnach, it's connected to uh, British Puritanism and trying to make something which was, uh, had a deep uh, uh, cultural, sexual 
you know, it, I, I like that kind of in, in India. I enjoy Kajuraho. I enjoy Konark uh, and so on. So I'm not, uh, and uh, Chidambaram, the temple sculpting. So I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not what the Madrasi women who kind of reinvented it as Bharat Natyam, Dance of India. Uh, I think uh, I like the uh, richer, deeper, more uh, complex uh, uh, history of it. But the Natya Shastra deeply, deeply affected me. Uh, uh, not the entire thing. I mean, it's a long, long book, chapter six, especially about Rasa. So, uh, uh, so that's enough of an introduction, I think. So I, I, uh, after that, I began a serious study of Ramlila, of Ramnagar. And I w went there in 1976, 1978, 1980 something, 1990, 1999, 2000. The last time I saw the complete Ramlila, it's 31 days, is in 2013. And I don't know if you've read it, but I've written a lot about the, the Ramlila and I, I've uh, written a lot about Benares and uh, the, the city and, you know, Kashi, the multiple city, I, I called it a performed imaginary. And I'm continuously working on a couple of books on Ramlila. I took, I was uh, privileged, I, I, I met the, the, uh, the Vibhuti Narayan Singh, who was the Maharaja of, from 1936 or 37 something till he passed in 2000 or 2001 and then his son Anant Narayan Singh. But the old uh, Maharaja took a liking to me so he gave me permission. I think I was one of the first people, even Indian, to take photographs. I, and I've taken more than 8,000 photographs of Ramlila. I have the world's largest archive of it. It's here and it's not open to the public. I don't know when or if ever I'll open it to the public because it's a complex uh, performance. In the, but some people have used it. I've published some of those pictures and some films. And But also studying the process of how the Ramlila is made because it's a performance in Ramnagar. Have you ever seen it in Ramnagar? where it takes 31 days and it goes all over the different town and it uh, has the, uh, the, let's call it the hidden text of Valmiki because that's the basic story, but it has the actual text of the Ramcharit Manas of Tulsi Das and then it has Samvads that were constructed by uh, Bharatandru Harsh Chandra. And he, uh, again, I, I, I'm assuming you know a lot of this, but sometimes one doesn't, you know, uh, know everything. I mean, I don't know what your background is, but uh, do you know who Harsh Chandra was? Uh, he was the one who coined the phrase um, uh, Hindi, I mean, Hindu, Hindi, Hindustan. Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. That uh, if we want to uh, be a country, then like England, we have to have a language. So he was the one that uh, constructed modern Hindi or partly was the one who constructed modern Hindi out of Urdu and the Hindi Braj, the different forms of the language, but the standardized Hindi, he was largely responsible for that. But he was also therefore largely responsible for the Samvads, the dialogues of Ramlila of Ramnagar, so that they people could come and they could see the gods, you know, Ram and his uh, brothers and Sita speaking this modern Hindi in the late 19th century. So the Samvads were a compilation of poetry and a new dialogue constructed by Harsh Chandra and uh, a group of uh, poets and scholars working with the Maharaja at the time. And uh, so that the Tulsi was being chanted, but Tulsi's Hindi is to modern Indians, more or less what Chaucer or Shakespeare, it's not not the Hindi that you speak in the streets, but the Samvads are much closer. Of course, they're constructed in the 19th century, so they're not exactly, but they're in the Braj, which is a form of Hindi spoken in, uh, in that part of uh, Uttar Pradesh. And so the people saw the uh, king, or Ram, you know, the god, who's going to institute Ram Raj, who's going to put the country together and rule it, speaking this language. So it has a political as well as religious resonance. So I've gone back and I've studied that a lot. Uh, and then I've also used Rasa in my own work. I mean, I, this is enough of an introduction. I'm, you know, so. Thank you so much. Exactly what you want to talk about, yeah. but that's some of my yeah. background. It, it gives a good uh, intro to the conversation. 
And uh, I was just speaking to an art historian yesterday. Yes. Uh, and uh, she was, she's, she's a Dutch uh, Bharatanatyam dancer, uh, Lisbeth uh, Pankaja. And uh, she, she was telling, uh, talking about how um, Westerners combine theory and performance uh, and they want, they want to have an intellectual engagement with the performing arts. Whereas in India, she said, was uh, it's very clear the demarcation between the scholar and the performer. The performer, um, just like you said, starts at a very young age and just gets into action. I read your stories about it. They, they, uh, they're not, um, uh, they don't need to understand the how and what and from where they, they are inheriting this uh, thing. They just need to start doing it. They just need to start performing and training their bodies for this. They can, if, if they so wish, get into the academic part a little later uh, when they mature, if they are so inclined and they can even do without it because they just, they just uh, thrown right in the midst of the performing art. You you combine both, and what are the benefits of seeing the Natya Shastra both as an academic text and in performance for right. a non Indian? So I want to disagree with uh, that mm. Dutch performer. I think mm. most performers around the world do it that way. Most Western performers or Japanese performers or African performers don't know from theory and don't care. So uh, uh, you talk to an American actor. Uh, you know, whether it's Meryl Streep or an ordinary actor, they, I, I'd be shocked if they really knew anything uh, deeply historical or theoretical. And they also study, it's a different kind of study, but you study acting as acting and performing and music with teachers and so on. So I don't see that huge uh, divide. I think most artists are not particularly theoretically inclined. Uh, uh, so, some are, but most, most are not. And when they are, uh, as teachers are, they're more or less along the mythic lines of theory, not the critical lines of theory. So there's a there's a there's a big big difference uh, whether you accept the Natya Shastra as truth or whether you accept it as a historical document. So uh, I think when artists accept the Natya Shastra or Stanislavski's uh, an actor prepares or something, they're accepting these things as truth. Me, and uh, their uh, truth is a negotiable. Uh, operation. And I've always been skeptical, uh, even though at one point uh, I'm an initiated um, uh, Hindu. My name is Jaya Ganesh. I'm a Brahmin. I have the thread. I underwent the initiation rites. And uh, part of my motive was uh, I was deeply moved by Hinduism. And uh, also I did not, I was not asked to give up my Judaism. So I'm a Jindu, if you want, or Hinduish. Uh, so I'm both. But uh, uh, also, I, I lived in temples, and I and I wanted to, uh, including the great Sank Sankat Mochan temple near uh, Benares, and uh, I would would not have been allowed to go to the inner sanctums or to live there if I was not a Hindu, because it was not so. It was partly it was partly to gain access, partly as uh, a, a kind of belief, and partly as curiosity. At any rate. Uh, to uh, uh, my own interest early on, you know, I've always been, uh, uh, let's say, competent both in scholarship and in art. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a different mode of thinking. When I'm rehearsing, when I'm working that way, I'm not, I'm not being uh, critical about myself to some degree or about the work I'm doing. I'm not I'm not being uh, uh, suspicious or skeptical of it or wondering about its history. I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't feel any need to be consistent. In other words, I don't feel that because I think the Natya Shastra as a historical text says such and such, if I'm going to use it, I have to use it as such and such. Any more than Picasso, when he looked at African masks, felt he had to replicate them in their cultural authenticity and specificity. This gets me in trouble, of course, because I'm promiscuous as an artist and hopefully responsible as a scholar. Uh, but I, I live that, I live that uh, double life. So uh, I, I've forgotten your specific question. So what, what did, we wanted to know something about the Nakya Shastra and my artistic work or, or, yeah. Yeah. or why? 
uh, how, how do you bring your scholarship? How does it impact on the performance? If how is the performance enhanced if if you're also a scholar? Right. Did you read the essay Rasa Aesthetics? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Rasa is Yeah, there are, uh, sorry, uh, but uh, obviously there's a, a greater appreciation, even in Carnatic music, if you actually know, if you've, you know, made an effort to come halfway to understand what it's about. The appreciation is more, and the uh, level of engagement with the uh, art is more, but it can still be appreciated at a level, even if you have not studied it. Of course, uh, it's it's like it's like you know rasa is a uh, the metaphor of rasa is juice or flavor, and it's very much like food. Uh, you can enjoy food without being a great connoisseur of food or wine. Uh, there are millions of, of varieties of wine. If you happen to be a French connoisseur, you might be able to know 1876 wine from 19. Uh, I, I don't, but the. But that doesn't mean that if you don't have that knowledge, you don't still enjoy it. But it's but let's put it this way. So here's enjoyment and here's knowledge. When they are equal, you can have a fuller appreciation. So the more your knowledge goes, the more your enjoyment will go. But that doesn't mean for yourself you don't enjoy it. So somebody at a very low level of knowledge may actually very much love an Odyssey dancer and watch her dance and so on. One of my great favorites was Sanjukta Panagrahi. And uh, I knew her quite well. And she gave me one of her bells from her dancing. And so insofar as I, I knew about a little bit about uh, uh, dancing in Orissa, and knew about Odyssey, the, and knew about Rasa and what she was doing and about Abhinaya, I could enjoy it more and more. Uh, if I knew less, I still could enjoy it. So it's it's a it's a question that uh, uh, the the knowledge enhances you, but that's that's at the spectator level, at the artistic level, at the creative level, it's different. So that uh, I, I I am not a classical dancer, but insofar as I was a, cla a, a classical dancer, then I have to take or my yoga practice is this way. I have to take what is given to me and do it as it was given to me, knowing that the very fact of my doing it will make change. We cannot actually imitate exactly. So that's how a tradition develops. A tradition is constrained by what you take and it changes by what you give to the next generation. Now, traditionalists will always say it never changes, but if we look at it historically, we can see it does change. Let's take the Natya Shastra itself. So there were, uh, eight rasas in Bharat's book, uh, but there are nine rasas now. So how did that happen? That's that's fundamental. Well, Abhinavagupta, who was lived in the 10th century in Kashmir, made a commentary and was very, very influenced by Buddhism or what became Buddhism or a certain kind of Hindu Buddhist uh, notion of transcendence. Now, classical Hinduism as expressed in the eight rasas have no shanta, have no transcendence. But after Abhinavagupta, this becomes actually maybe for some the most important rasa, because it is when I'm asked to describe shanta, I say, think of a rainbow. So a rainbow has many, many different colors. And those are the eight rasas. But if you get them all in perfect balance, you don't have any color. It's completely clear. There's no color. It's a paradox. But that's Shanta. You can get to Shanta by experiencing all the basic rasas in such harmony and sympathy that they they all disappear. And if you and I say if you think that's uh, peculiar, just look at light. That's exactly what happens to light. Light is clear until you refract it, and then it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. It happens to be the same number as the rasas. That's a paradox. So uh, as an artist, I, I was fascinated. I, I, I did the Rasa boxes exercise. I was fascinated by a non-Stanislavskian way towards emotion. In other words, what I saw Bala do, uh, I should describe this, the performance I saw. Please, please, can you just describe the Rasa box for our viewers? Ah, the Rasa yeah. box. Well, but you have the essay. Why don't you just 
publish the essay. Okay, the Rasa box, I, I can't really describe it in its full detail because it's very complex, but fundamentally you, you put on the floor of your workshop room, a grid of nine boxes. In other words, three lines this way, three lines that way, and a perimeter, so you have nine. And each of the eight around the edge, because there are eight of them around the edge, only one in the center, is assigned a rasa, Shringara, Bibhatsa, uh, Raudra, Karuna, what, you know, whatever. And it's usually assigned randomly, because each time you do the exercise, a different box will be a different thing. It's not it's just that eight. The center one is called Shanta, because it is the it is the ninth rasa, and it is the one that does not meet the world on the outside. All right. The exercise itself is how do you move from one rasa to the other instantly? So how do you go from uh, uh, Karuna to Raudra to Shringara? You know, boom, boom, boom. Now. The exercise takes days to develop, and it starts by drawing and in and, and, and different places, different individuals, what they interpret this as. So unlike classical Indian training, where someone might say, uh, uh, let, let's take uh, Bharat Natyam, to express Sringara, you do such and such, or this music is in a Sringaric uh, mode, you know, uh, similarly. Uh, in mine, no, it's very subjective. It depends on the particular people who are assembled. So your aparna, so what on this day is your uh, karuna? What on this day is your vipatsa? And, and, but you have to, uh, when you're in the box, you express it directly, not through memory, not through status logic, not through, but what, that's me and Hatsa. Asya, you know, you go one to the other and you get that sense of being what uh, Anthony Artaud, a Western uh, theorist called an athlete of the emotion. Part of it was my observing athletes. I like, I like sports a lot. So what happens to a, a, a great uh, uh, football player or cricket player or whatever, whatever, while the game is on, they're so intensely involved. Then a whistle blows, there's, there's a timeout, and they stop. Then the whistle blows again, and they do it. So they don't have a long preparation. They have a long training. But once, once they're in the game, they go in and out. So my, I, I do give the performers long training in yoga, in breathing, in various exercises. But once they're in the rasa box, it's instant. And then they stop. When they're in the box, they're doing it. When they're out of the box, they're not. But then you can use rasa boxes to uh, analyze uh, uh, performances in text. So, for example, let's take something a uh, Western play that I'm sure uh, almost all Indians also know, Romeo and Juliet. So you ask of, uh, let's say, the role of uh, Juliet, uh, what is your basic rasa? So usually a person would uh, uh, say no, and they'd say, Shringara, love. Obviously, she's driven by love. And she uh, sees Romeo and love is everything. I said, yeah, that, that may be, but maybe, maybe it's Raudra. How is that? Well, because maybe she is so angry at her parents from their constriction that she would love the first boy she makes because she's doing what teenagers do. She's not really in love with Romeo. She wants to be separate from her parents. She hates the restrictions. And so she'll surely pick a, a Montague to fall in love with, not a Capulet, not who they have arranged. All right, so when you're performing, I ask the actor, like, what is your basic Ras? If it's Shringara, then everything on top of it, yes, she'll be angry at her parents, but that anger will be infused with the flavor of Shringara. But if it's the other way around, if it's Raudra, yes, she'll love Romeo, but that love will be infused with the anger against her parents, but it, it may be also Karuna, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a question of the performer then deciding, that's called layering, which rasa is underneath, which is above, and the tone. So you can use rasa as it, when you're making a performance to help uh, actors, this are, these are in the Western mode, not uh, classical Indian actors who have their own set of abhinayas and so on, but you can have actors understand 
the emotional through line of their roles. So that not only is there a, a through line of the overall rasa of the character, but then in each scene, there's a different rasa or mixture. So you could layer rasas that what I just said was uh, Shringara is the basic one and uh, uh, Raudra is the next one, or it may be the other way around, or you could mix them. What does it mean to mix anger and, uh, and love? To mix Shringara and Raudra, which is different than layering them. Yes. So, uh, and you, and food. Yes. food is a very good example. You can have a layer cake and you can have the flavor of vanilla and then chocolate icing. That's, that's layering. Or you can mix it together and have something like a vanilla chocolate milkshake, which puts both flavors together. So at any rate, the uh, Rasa theory gives me a chance to discuss this with actors. And the Rasa boxes is a way to train people in their, in their uh, uh, expression of emotion, direct expression of emotion, not yet attached to characters. You do that, you do that later in the exercise. Now there's a whole book about Rasa boxes coming out that my colleagues have put together. I'm in the book, but there's a whole book of it coming out. It'll be out in about a year from uh, Routledge Publishers. So that'll explain it. Uh, but like uh, traditional uh, performer training, the best way to learn about Rasa boxes is to practice it. And there are workshops be given. I don't do them anymore myself because uh, I'm busy writing and doing other things, but there are many people who uh, teach Rasa boxes. And I've actually taught them in India uh, and they could be taught, uh, you know, they can be taught anywhere. So uh, uh, there are people who do, do teach it. Oh, uh, what is, uh, what is, you, you've mentioned the difference between feelings and uh, emotions with respect to the uh, yes. actors. And there was a, a musician who, uh, who in an interview and he was, he was telling us that, uh, you know, when, uh, when he finishes his concert, people come up to him and say, you know, you've uh, shown us Krishna when you were singing, we could, the Lord Krishna appeared before us. So uh, he said, you know, the, that's not possible because I, I have not seen Lord Krishna even after singing for so many years. So where, where does uh, it uh, go from, where does the performer start experiencing what the, you know, he's, because he's doing these steps, this Abhinaya, and he's, he's going according to what he's been trained to do. So he's delivering the impact is there. But uh, sometimes uh, he fails in experiencing it himself. Is, is no, that you performance? Don't to, you don't have to experience it yourself. The, the, the Rasik experience, there are several kinds, but one is what's going on between the Abhinaya, the expression, and the reception. So uh, th this is a, a very old debate within at least Western acting theory whether you ex have to experience. So if I want to express great anger and I never want to see you again, never. But I have felt nothing. And yet by making the expression, raising my voice, constricting my throat, opening my eyes, I did feel something because I can't go through that process without it having some kind of effect. But it's a much, much different effect than if I'm actually angry at someone. Now, Stanislavski and the certain kinds of acting demand that you actually experience the thing. But that is again, not like an athlete, that's going up to that rage and coming down from it. I'm more interested in the expression than the experience of the expression. I want you, Aparna, to experience from me the anger that is between us, which is a, a thing to be investigated rather than whether I experience it or not is irrelevant. Even whether you experience it or not is irrelevant. It's more like what's between us uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the exchange that, uh, that it's, it, it is what it's about. So- uh, Yeah, but, but we also say that uh, the end goal of all performing arts of all Indic knowledge systems uh, is not just entertainment it's to realize to be one with Brahman and to its bhakti marga so given the indic tradition uh, would this still hold good 
Yeah, well, of course, <laughs> uh, we want all our Atmans to finally merge with our with the Brahman. I, I, but uh, just like your musician friend, uh, that's the uh, theory. Uh, and I think most people, if they told the truth, would say that they have not experienced that. Occasionally, maybe we experience that in, in our lifetimes. It couldn't be described if it wasn't experienced by someone. I've seen it in Ramlila at the end of each night when the uh, RT ceremony is performed in the uh, illumination and the spectators are having darshan of the swarups, the gods, they are in communication with these. And I get swept into that as well for that, for that moment. At the same time, I've watched these boys rehearse during the morning and play football. So I know that Ram is Ram and is not Ram. But even within the Indian uh, uh, theory, uh, there uh, each of our Atmans participate. So that boy is a boy, but he's also a Ram. But when he has his crown on, when he's doing the gestures, he is completely infused by Ram. But it's it's a paradox. I mean, there are paradoxes within paradoxes. In Ramlila again, uh, the boys who are performing the Swarups are all different ages and sizes. They have to be in this Ramlila pre-pubescent. So one is 11 and one is nine, one is eight. And the uh, uh, Shatrugan is the smallest. And then uh, usually uh, Lachman is next. And then, uh, 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 you know, uh, Bharat is uh, usually a little smaller, but Ram always has to be the tallest. Ram would never be not the tallest. And yet in the story, they're twins. They were all born the same day. They're all, they all have parts of Vishnu in them. And two of them are twins, Shatrugan and Bharat are, are twins. So how come in Ramlila, Shatrugan is like this and, and Bharat is always like that. They were born, they're, they're actually twins with the same mother. So again, it's not about that kind of logic. It's about the logic of the performance, the logic of the narrative. That's why the imaginary is so powerful. Now, I don't look at the imaginary as a uh, debased category. I'm more, even in everything I do, more in the Indian idea of uh, uh, Maya and Leela. Yes, it's all Maya. It's all an illusion. It's all Leela. It's all play. But Maya and Leela is what we have of ultimate reality. Uh, we don't have the Brahman. <laughs> Maybe when I pass, I will go there and maybe I will come back as somebody else or something else. Maybe not, I don't know. But uh, uh, I, I live and I practice a world of Maya Lila. I know of the world of Brahman. And I guess I've seen some sadhus who claim to be there all the time or some, you know, maybe the Dalai Lama or something, but not Richard Schechner. So that uh, uh, I, I can't, I can speak of experience of Maya and Leela. I can only speak of theory about Brahman. And maybe once or twice in my life, once I had a near-death experience and it was a very extreme, uh, uh, powerful experience and I wrote it down when I finished it and maybe somewhere across that boundary there was something, but I don't know. I came back, I didn't go across the boundary. If I had gone across the boundary, I wouldn't be talking to you. So, uh, uh, you know, so I, I also think that the notion of Maya and Leela is very, very powerful for artists because it asserts that the play, the imaginary, the, uh, you know, exactly what Maya and Leela means is, 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 is what we have of ordinary life. So that art, to a certain degree, is a Maya Leela of a Maya Leela. You know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an enhanced version or an intensified version of Maya Lila. I've written a lot about that too. I mean, I, I wrote, uh, I, uh, I have a, a, a book called uh, uh, Future of Ritual, which writes about ritual and play. I mean, so uh, these are not ideas that I'm giving to you for the first time. And uh, how does your yoga practice how does it come together with your? Uh, no, those are questions I, I don't really ask systematically. I do like yoga. The inner, the inner world and the outer world. 
I do yoga, you know, uh, as a, uh, later today, I'll do some yoga as modified Pilates. Again, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not bothered by consistency or purity. Uh, in other words, I don't. So if I'm going to do some of my yoga poses and uh, some of my asanas and breathing and things that I was uh, taught, uh, I, I do them as best I can. At age 86, I can't do what I did at 40. I just can't. I used to be able to stand on my head and do a full lotus position and raise up and down. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that make my yoga practice any less? It makes it different, but not less. So I think if one lives a life, even as you get on in life, as I have, of regrets of what I no longer have, you're not going to really have the rasa, the flavor of the life you're living. So whatever your portion, I mean, I, uh, I, I accept that people in great duress, I'm not talking about people in great duress who are uh, very, very poor or starving or very ill. Those, it's hor horrific and I never want to be in that position. But within the range of a certain amount of uh, comfort and a certain amount of uh, necessaries, you have to uh, savor the food that's on your plate, not the food that used to be on your plate. <laughs> and if you live a life of regret, you're going to get unhappier and unhappier. And also you'll not be able to continue working mm -hmm. and you'll not be able to continue uh, uh, doing things because as life goes on, you'll more and more say, well, gee, uh, I'm not doing that anymore, and I can't do this anymore, and and life will get sad. You'll move into despair, and that's not a state that I want to recommend to anyone. A, a lot of uh, non-Indians come and learn uh, Carnatic music and also Hindustani music right. uh, because, especially the rhythm aspect. Because right. they feel the uh, uh, learning Indian rhythm is, helps to, you know, uh, develop a sense of laya in their own music. It's not that they want to become Carnatic musicians. So in right. this uh, intercultural uh, interaction with uh, between non-Indians and Indian art, um, what is it that the Natya Shastra can offer to, uh, uh, to of course, it's the Rasa theory. But uh, if, if given very little time, and if they're not able to come to India and spend as much time as you did, what can they actually, how can it benefit them uh, in their, if they don't think, want to actually become, you know, uh, get into I think it. it? I think it's uh, different for different people. Mm -hmm. You know, some people like Joseph Conrad, the great uh, author who wrote in English, but was Polish and was born into Poland, uh, Polish would take a very small incident and write a whole novel. Uh, you know, other people have to. So it, it depends on. You know, sometimes you can have a very deep experience swiftly, and sometimes you can spend years and never get anything. It just uh, you learn the mechanics, but you never get the the uh, indwelling form of it, as Aristotle would say, the indwelling form the uh, fundamental form, you would not get the rasa, you would not get the flavor of it. So I, I think that people should learn other cultures and perform other cultures insofar as they can, simply as a, uh, if for nothing else, to stretch their uh, imaginations, to stretch the possibilities. In other words, the paradox of being human is that by origin, we all came from one or two, so there's Lucy, whoever it is, uh, near contemporary, as best we know, Uganda and so on. And several times bands of humans went out of Africa so that you look different than I to some degree and you have your bindu and you're dressed uh, uh, Indian style, et cetera, et cetera. And you're sitting over, over there in Bangalore and I'm in Manhattan, but somewhere genetically we are brother and sister uh, we are very, very, you go back far enough and there's no separation between us. So if we think, you know, it's a metaphor that people have used a lot, but as, as humans, there's a huge tree and this branch is very, very far from this branch, but you go back, it's the same trunk. But at the same time, 
you want to maintain the separation. It's not only a branch, this is an apple and this is a grape. So you want to see what is the relationship to it. For me, I think that insofar as you can uh, have cultural experiences that are different than the ones you were brought up in, that will be help, healthy for you because that will remind you of the fabulous truth of human existence. We are each different and we are all the same. So uh, it's both true. So we can, uh, you know, genetically we can breed with each other. So there's absolutely nothing. It's not like uh, sheep and horse, they can't breed with each other. So, so we're, we're genetically quite close, but culturally we're quite different. 